Good evening, good evening. I am Dr. Charlotte Leach. I am an associate minister of Morningstar Missionary Baptist Church, uh, where the pastor is my husband, Reverend Dr. Dennis Leach. And I am also a member of the Minister's Conference of Winston-Salem and vicinity. I am the second vice president, and I am also the chair of the education committee. We thank you so much for joining us this evening in this webinar about the Leandro Plan, present, past, present, and what's next. At this time, I want to introduce Pastor Tim B. La Covington, and she is the president of the Ministers Conference of Winston-Salem and Vicinity. She's also the newly appointed pastor at Exodus United Baptist Church in Winston-Salem. As a bi-vocational pastor, she works at Neighbors for Better Neighborhoods, a grassroots nonprofit, and serves as the Strengthening Neighborhoods and Family Program Director, Pastor Covington. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Charlotte Leach for that kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us in this critical discussion and information session on the Leandro case. As you have already heard from Reverend Charlotte Leach, this online event will provide us with more information about the Leandro case with a historical timeline up until now. Following Mr. Matthews Ellenwood's presentation, we will have a panel discussion with Superintendent Tricia McManus and Forsyth County Association of Educator President, Ms. Val Young. They will also entertain some questions from the audience during the panel discussion. I would like to recognize the organizations that organized tonight's online program, and they are Action for Equity, North Carolina Justice Center, the Forsyth County Association of Educators, and the Minister's Conference of Winston-Salem and Vicinity. So without further ado, allow me to present our next presenter, Ms. Val Young. Ms. Young is a lifelong citizen of Winston-Salem, she was educated in the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School Systems, and she graduated with a degree in education from Winston-Salem State University. Ms. Young taught at Ashley Elementary School for 20 years, and now she is the president of the Forsyth County Association of Educators. Again, we would like to welcome you and thank you for joining this webinar. Thank you, Pastor Covington. I'm going to have um, Mr. Matt Ellingwood from North, North Carolina Justice Center to explain to, to us to explain to us what the, the Leandro case is, um, what happened in the past, what's happening now, and what's going to happen in the future. Um, I know a lot of people have really want to know what's going on. It's been years. It's been you know, I hate to say decade, but it has been, and people want to know what's going on and what can we do. Thanks so much, Val. Um, while I'm pulling this up, I'll, I just had kind of a crazy time putting my two kids to bed, but I feel like I'm in the right place because I need people to help me figure out how to educate my kids and to pray for me. So I'm in the right spot right now. So I appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to pull up the presentation to share. Um, as Val mentioned, there's a lot of past to talk about, and I'm actually more excited than I have been in a really long time to talk about what we think might be coming next. Um, we're very hopeful that something positive can happen that's going to do more to enforce the children's rights and the rights that are enshrined in the North Carolina Constitution. So hopefully everybody can see what I've got pulled up here. So as Val alluded to, this Leandro case is been going on for quite some time. It's uh, It deals with the interpretation of how our state constitution's education provisions, um, what does it actually take to make those rights real? Um, it's been going on since 1994 when the case was filed by five low wealth districts, Polk, Halifax, Robison, Vance, and Cumberland. There's could have been any districts though. Honestly, there are tons of districts that have similar profiles financially, 
terms of the tax base that they're able to um, access to fund schools locally. There's a lot of places that just are unable to fund a, a school system that meets the constitutional minimum. And it's actually not through any effort of their own as this, the original suit claimed that districts didn't have enough uh, resources to provide an adequate education to their students. They're actually the, the lowest wealth 10 county, the lowest wealth 10 counties, the 10 lowest wealth counties, I'll say, um, actually tax themselves at twice the rate as the 10 highest wealth counties. But that generates about half as much funding for education just because there's so much, uh, there's so many concentrations of poverty in certain counties in our state. <clears throat> um, eventually that case made its way up to the North Carolina Supreme Court in 97. That's where the standard you may have heard of that was developed in the Leandro case that all, all children have the right to an opportunity to receive a sound basic education. As the case moved back and forth in the courts over the years, um, <clears throat> we sort of got a little bit more information about what that means. In fact, that's kind of, that is not really that helpful. You know, it's kind of vague. What's a sound basic education? Doesn't sound like the most aspirational standard. In some ways it's not, um, sorry, but it's got some common sense reforms that would really make a big difference. So in 2004, Judge Howard Manning, uh, ruled that the state was continuing to fail to meet its constitutional duty and that the, that the state must staff each classroom with a competent, well-trained teacher certified in the subject that they teach, staff each school with a competent, well-trained principal. And then we have developed over time different education plans and standards and things, um, state level the things that are being assessed. So we have to identify the resources that are necessary to ensure all children with a particular emphasis on at-risk children have an equal opportunity to access a sound basic education. Fast forward many rounds of hearings and things where not a lot of progress happened. Until 2017, we started to see some changes that, that caught our interest as this being a really exciting opportunity. This is one of the hardest things to try to move is the, are these big picture school funding adequacy questions and also equity. How is the funding that we have distributed? Is it going to the students and communities that need it most to help children overcome um, barriers to learning? Um, or is it what we actually have now, which is everybody's getting kind of a flat amount. There's not much difference between what the, the, the lowest need and highest need students are receiving on a per student basis. So in 2017, one big change was that we had never gotten much buy-in from the governors of the state, regardless of party, in actually coming up with a plan for how we were going to remedy the constitutional violation that's been identified since 1997. But Governor Cooper joined with the plaintiffs to, and agreed to work out the development of a plan to meet the state's constitutional obligation, and then that would then in turn become a judgment in the case. Um, at the same time, he created um, this commission on access to a sound basic education that included a lot of different education leaders. Uh, Mark Jewell, the former uh, NCAA president was involved, as well as the executive director of my organization, the North Carolina Justice Center, um, Rick Glazier. And uh, it had a lot of uh, deans of education schools and things like that. Also some people who worked locally from uh, county commissioners and school boards perspective um, to try to come up with some recommendations of what the state's plan ought to look like. At the same time that was happening, oh, the other big development was that Judge David Lee became the new judge in the case that had resided in Judge Howard Manning's courtroom for many, many years before he retired. That's really a, was a major change because it had gotten kind of hung up and not going anywhere in his courtroom. So when Judge Lee came in, I think he thought, we don't want this thing to be hanging around for another you know, 20 plus years without there being any resolution. I think he was anxious to try to figure out how do we finally meet these obligations to, to give children opportunities that we haven't been doing since at least this was identified in 1997 and in reality much longer than that. So I think everyone recognized this is a really complex thing though. How do you go about reforming our entire education system in terms of how it's funded? Also the, all the different policies that are at play. How do you go about doing that? It's a really big undertaking. So we brought, we decided to um, bring in some independent consultant experts You'll hear about this thing called the WestEd Report. It's actually WestEd and another organization called Learning Policy Institute. And they worked in partnership with NC State to have some local researchers involved. And what I liked about this particular approach that they use, I mean, 
you can do all kinds of statistical models and stuff that show how much should we increase funding to get results that we want and things. But they, and they did that in an expert way. And that's come a long way over the years in terms of how good people have gotten at figuring that out. But what they did also was they did the, convene these professional judgment panels is that part of the problem with what's happened in this case is that no one's actually gone back and talked to people who are in the, educators who are in the schools, parents, administrators, people who are closest to the children whose rights have been impacted to say, are any of these plans or reforms that have been adopted actually having the, you know, the needed impact to change outcomes in your school? So they convened these panels across the state, talked to literally thousands of people and uh, really wanted to know what are the resources you are missing in your school that you need tomorrow in order to help make these kids' rights a reality. Is it, you don't have enough counselors, you don't have enough therapists, we don't have you know, reading specialists. What is it that you need? Are we not starting early enough in early childhood to actually meet the standards that's been developed in this case? So that report was, repeat, was released in 2019. And we'll go through the recommendations that it included in a minute, but I'm just gonna go through the, uh, a little bit more of the timeline. As you can see, there was a lot of activity in 2020 where the state developed the remedial plan based on the large part on these West Ed recommendations that we'll go through. And that became a consent order that the judge entered. The governor's commission that I alluded to a minute ago um, approved their final recommendations, which mirrored a lot of what's in the West Ed report, included some of their own. Um, and then in tw June, 2020, the state submitted its plan. This is what we need to happen the plan that was developed by Wested is phased in over eight years. I think there's a recognition that we can't change this overnight, but we needed to have a roadmap for how we go about meeting kids' rights. Um, and, it, and that we needed to have really concrete steps over time of how that was gonna work. So state submitted its first year. And then what we've had really after that is orders to, to have the plans for the years that come after that and also check-ins to see how and how uh, progress is going on this comprehensive remedial plan. We call it, we'll call it the Leandro plan. Um, Judge Lee then signed off on that plan and directed the state to implement the plan. So then as the state is represented by the governor and the state board of education, um, you know, it's, it's one of the interesting things about the case is that the legislature is part of the state, but they haven't actually been involved in any of these hearings. They, they certainly could have been, but chose not to and left it up to the governor and state board to deal with it. Now, as we move forward, we'll see that they're gonna intervene in the case. Um, but at any rate, the state, that's what I mean by the state, the governor and the state board up until this point, um, they submitted their progress reports to the court 2021 and there, you could see in all the elements of the plan, there were some things that were getting done, largely things that could be accomplished without any kind of funding or resources. And then there were all kinds of items in the plan that made no progress. And it was identified that the reason they can't make any progress is because there's no resources being um, you know, given by the General Assembly to actually carry forth this plan. You just can't do it with no resources. Um, so in September, the judge held a status conference and gave the state until October to fully implement the plan. And that was directed a little bit more clearly at the legislature to fund the next two years of the plan, really looking at the actual budget process, the state two-year two budget process that was going on at that time to include the funding in that budget. Um, then when that wasn't starting to not be clear, that wasn't going to happen. The judge asked the plaintiffs to submit legal theories for how we can go about directing adequate funding to implement the plan. And I don't have a, a little bit, I'm missing a little bit here um, where at one point that trial court judge did go ahead and order the, the release of funds to actually implement this plan. That was then recently overturned by the court of appeals and um, at least the, well, not the part saying that we need resources and that we're violating the constitution, just the part of where he ordered the treasurer and the controller to release these funds. They said that only the general assembly can do that. So now it's a big mess going to the Supreme Court where we have the legislators, as I mentioned, intervening in the case and appointing their own attorneys. Um, some parts of the that appellate court order have been appealed. Um, by different, some by the state, some by the other plaintiffs involved. 
And um, it feels like what's going to happen is the Supreme Court's going to have to take all those different pieces and work it all out. And they're going to have to decide wh where we go from here. How do we go about enforcing children's rights? Because you can't, we've determined you can't do it without resources. And those resources, according to the appellate court, have to be administered by the, by the um, General Assembly. So how far could the North Carolina Supreme Court go in ensuring that we actually have the resources needed to implement this plan? Um, this plan is seen as what's the bare minimum for our, our constitutional standards. So just to back up a little bit of, again, how we got here, it's not just that the governor changed and the judge changed, that there was a, some major changes in the way education funding worked and a lot of major policy changes that were pretty radical over the past decade that had a big impact on the state's ability to fund education. So we're fortunate in the state that the North Carolina Constitution puts a really heavy em emphasis on education. There's no right to education in the federal, in the U.S. Constitution, where all of the most of the rights that we kind of think that we have, freedom of speech, those types of things, are coming from the U.S. Constitution. But the right to education lives in the various state constitutions. I think every single state, or almost every state, has a, an education provision in their constitution. We have a really particular. We have several, and we have some that are very strong, like this one which says the General Assembly shall provide by taxation and otherwise for a general and uniform system, free public schools, and wherein equal opportunities shall be provided for all students. I don't think anyone's ever tried to argue that we've met that last bit of the standard or come even close, but it's a very aspirational standard that we're gonna be providing equal opportunities for all students. It's a very strong provision to rest on when we're trying to you know, enforce children's rights. So that's been fortunate. And that has led to the, the kind of break. This is the breakdown of per student expenditures in the state by their source. So you can see like most states are the same where about 10% or so comes from federal, um, you know, 20. And then what's different is North Carolina has a really high state share of funding. And um, other states, particularly in the Northeast, have that will have that look reversed where there's more of the funding coming locally. This is a good thing for several reasons. I think one is it's coming from the constitutional provision that because we had some districts that were so that lacked resources to the extent, this is going all the way back to like the big Great Depression where some districts couldn't even afford to have their own schools without significant help from the state. And then, you know, just the fact that we have that really strong state role in education from the constitution has led to the state having a huge role in the way schools are funded. This is this also helps with equity because we will see in the states where it's funded locally, then you end up finding having these really wild disparities between really wealthy areas and areas with high concentrations of poverty. This allows you to the state to play a role in ensuring that equitable resources, that resources are reaching students who have the greatest barriers to learning in communities that have the most need. Um, so this breakdown is a good thing. And I think it's also this is an important thing for sharing with advocates and parents so they can understand how school funding works because I think most of us when we have an issue with the way our school's going about doing things or buses aren't running on time or there's staffing shortages we go maybe to the to our teacher to our principal maybe if we're hyper motivated we'll think about our local board of education or something like that but what a lot of so it makes it hard because a lot of people don't realize it's this kind of far off feeling entity the state that's actually playing the largest role and the resources that are in your school locally. So something we really want to impress upon people, the role of the state is really important in what your school looks like. So following the Great Recession, we had these really big revenue losses that hurt our ability to fund education. Um, and we've never really recovered from that the way other states have for reasons that we'll get into in a minute. But so you can see we weren't great. We were always below average on things like there's lots of different ways you can look at this decline that's occurred, but you know, we were, we were below the average to begin with on teacher pay. It's kind of been a bipartisan thing where we've underfunded a lot of things both parties have over a long period of time. Um, but you can see we got a little bit closer. We got real far off and then we got, we're getting a little closer again now, but we're still further away than we were um, kind of at the, at the end of the Great Recession. Same thing with if you look at per people expenditures where it's actually grown even more than the sort of teacher pay gap between the national average. Um, so this is a thing called school funding effort. This is how much money does your state have expressed by the state gross domestic product. So how much money is your state generating 
what percentage of that are you putting into education? So this is just a kind of an ugly looking graph, but of, of how North, North Carolina compares to other Southern states. So if we were to put this on a map with, um, you know, states elsewhere in the nation, it would probably look even worse, although we're at the bottom, so it can't be much worse than that, but we would be even further, further down. Um, we have we are consistently getting Fs on different like school funding measures that are done by national organizations like Education Law Center um, for having the lowest school funding effort. So we could do a lot more. Um, that's had an impact, uh, as many people know, on the number of people who are choosing to go into the education profession. Um, that's been a, a difficult problem over in recent years, and we know we're having all these staffing problems this year as working conditions have gotten so difficult for teachers. Um, but it's not all from the pandemic. The, 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 some of the problems that we're seeing have really deep run roots going all the way back you know, to the inception of this case and beyond. Um, this is just to show why we've had this disparity grow in our state that other states instead of cutting taxes as the economy recovered, um, invested, have invested that money in education. Whereas North Carolina, you know, at, as the revenues increase, they've sort of frozen in the, the spending levels where they were after the economic crash and the great recession. So we sort of stayed at that same low level that we had to go to because we lost so much revenue, um, even as the economy has recovered. And you can see this is expressed in billions of dollars. So we're talking about losing over three and a half billion dollars every year from where the tax code used to be eight, you know, almost 10 years ago compared to now. And that's all had really serious implications for the way our schools are funded. And that this is to show kind of what the classroom impacts of these funding shortfalls have been. So compared to 2008, 2009, we have fewer teachers, even as the population has grown. Um, we have significantly less instructional support personnel, counselors, nurses, psychologists. Um, we have less, significantly less principals and assistant principals. A big one is teaching assistant, teacher assistants that I think a lot, some teachers have sort of lived in a world of not having teacher assistants, but the more veteran teachers, I think that's something that's been felt really in a major way across the state. Um, central office has been cut a lot. And a lot of people don't cry for the central office, but that's where a lot of the supports for school turnaround models and some of the, you know, trainings and things like that that are really important for professional development come from there. Um, we have less money for non-instructional support, huge cuts to textbooks, and that's had a lag effect from year to year in supplies. You can sort of cut textbooks per year and get away with it, but if you do it for 10 so years straight, you develop this huge backlog of need. Um, and the average age of a textbook, the last time I checked in North Carolina was from 1997. Um, and of course we've eliminated funding professional development and mentors and things like master's degree pay for teachers um, over that same period. The other thing I should say before I move on to, because this, and this was in the West Ed report is all of that has had really big impacts on student achievement. We have some of the fastest growing opportunity gaps between uh, black and brown children, white children, uh, between economically disadvantaged students and their more affluent peers. peers. We have, that's been a gap that's been growing across the nation and uh, since the great recession, but it's actually growing out at the fastest rate uh, in the South and North Carolina is one of the fastest in the South in terms of how that's grown. So all of those cuts aren't just things that happen in the abstract, they're having really uh, big implications for kids. And we've seen other states that have had this type of like report that I'm going to talk about or some sort of effort to reform the funding system. If they actually do make substantial investments of the type that are recommended here, we've seen really big gains in outcomes for kids, um, especially in states like North Carolina that are kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel and are able to move up to average. That's where you can get some of the best, some of the biggest gains in terms of achievement by making investments in education. Um, so we get into this West Ed report. I'll try not to go too much in detail, but they found that the, the big finding, I think, was that we were making a little bit of progress in the early years of this case, um, but that over the past decade, these policy changes and funding cuts have left North Carolina further away from meeting its constitutional obligation to provide every child with the opportunity to receive sound basic education than it was when the Supreme Court 
North Carolina issued the Leandro decision originally in 1997. So we've actually gone further away as the case has moved on. It includes eight critical needs areas that were identified. Most of these are things I think folks will find to be common sense um, and things that we ought to be investing in. Um, it's nothing crazy or super innovative, but um, we're just we're missing so many of the essentials in our system uh, that need to be invested in. You know, a lot of it's about revising the school funding model so that the resources are actually reaching again the students who need them most. Um, the report recommends increasing this funding overall by $5 billion over the next eight years. And I'll end by that. It's just hard to, hard to get your head around that type of number. I don't know what that amount of money looks like, but I'll try to um, show what this would look like in a, a county level foresight at the end of this. Um, you know, there's recommendations about how we can go about recruiting and retaining high qualified teachers and diverse teacher teaching workforce. Um, something that we used to be a national leader in and we've had to bring back, we need to bring back things like the teaching fellows program, which is back, but in a very scaled down version of what it once was. And certainly the professional development mentoring cuts I mentioned earlier. Um, same thing with principals. Um, they were found to be the second most important in school factor on student outcomes after teachers. Um, there's problems with the comp it's compensation structure and we have difficulty attracting high quality principals to the schools where they're needed most. Um, big one that has a long history in the case is it was in some ways the state's only response that they've had at various points in the case is to do something on early childhood. So um, one of the important findings is providing all at risk children with the opportunity to attend high quality early childhood programs. I'll talk about what that would look like locally as well at the end. Um, we have really good programs, but not, as, not enough children who are able to enroll in them. And funding is a huge barrier. Um, it requires us to direct more resources to economically disadvantaged students. We have a lot more students who are living in poverty now than we did before the Great Recession. Um, certain districts are serving a disproportionate number of <clears throat> students with disabilities, English learners, um, and students who face additional uh, face opportunity gaps, and different school discipline disparities, um, other barriers to getting a high quality, getting to, to getting a quality education. Um, and then uh, it also requires us to revise the A through F grade system. That actually be one of the recommendations that doesn't really cost anything. They found it, over, it just seems to punish schools with high concentrations of poverty and doesn't recognize schools that are where there's a lot of growth, um, just looking at sort of raw test score data. Um, another is to build this statewide system for helping low, low performing schools improve. We've had this something similar as before that was been cut. Um, it seemed to be working well. So an idea is to bring that back. And the last one is one that we're really interested in. And uh, I work with this um, Every Child NC Coalition that um, NCA has been really supportive of. And uh, Kelly from Action for Equity has been a part of as one of our um, coordinating committee members. And um, we really hope that this, ex they said they're gonna convene this expert panel, but that, so the idea behind the coalition that formed was that throughout this history of the case, it's been this big sort of state level thing of districts against you know, the state. And so really the, the people who actually work closely with the students whose rights have been most violated, um, whether it's geographically in the rural areas and the areas of high concentrations of poverty, or whether it's people who actually work with English learners, students with disabilities, that these folks have not had a seat at the table in developing any of the plans or in determining if the plans are working. And if you don't have the people who are actually, whose lives are dedicated to doing this work involved in the development and implementation of these types of plans, they're never gonna work in our opinion. And that's really the, the whole idea behind this Every Child NC Coalition that we're part of. I'll drop the uh, links from them in the chat at the end of my presentation. Um, the idea was to really try to empower, you know, to, to, to ensure that the coalition was really grounded in the needs of, of students who are at risk and in the communities that were, that were originally identified as where students were having their rights most violated, um, that those are the folks who make all the decisions about how the coalition develops priorities, what we spend our resources on, 
um, what we want to advocate for, that those groups have to be the ones who form the coordinating committee that makes all of those decisions. Um, really proud of that, the, the way that's come together. And hopefully um, Kelly will be able to say more later as well. Um, but it's a, again, I'll drop in the chat, but it's a good way to get involved in, we have a lot of sort of ways to take action through that coalition um, that we can share on out. So just where we are now in terms of the, the funding of the, of the plan, you know, the, the, the most recent budget, what's, it's not the whole plan, it's just the, this two year period in the, at issue in the plan. Cause as I mentioned, it's an eight year plan that goes all the way out. So for that two year plan, portion of the plan, the legislature funded about half in year 21, 21-22, and then 43% in 22-23. This to me, just looking at it, just makes me think of what a big loss it was. And also it's one of the bigger wins we've had in a weird way, because you can't just fund this thing piecemeal. Um, it's about the, how our education system functions from early childhood all the way up onto the transition to college and career. And we all need every piece of that to be working in a way that's cohesive. Um, and that you can't fund 50% or 40% of somebody's constitutional right, you have to fund 100% of it. And that's what was determined in the case was needed. At the same time, this legislature has been, I've been doing this for about 10 years, this legislature has been very difficult to move on a lot of these issues, um, particularly something like this that the governor has, has taken on, and um, just the partisan nature of the way things work there. Um, I think the fact that this much of it was funded does show that this is an issue where there's a lot more leverage than other issues. Um, and if you look, these are big numbers, $330 million, $430 million in year two. Um, you know, again, in my time of trying to lobby, you know, do government relations there, um, it's been pretty hard to get things done. This is a major movement. And I think it's because the court case provides so much leverage and because these are investments that a lot of people believe in um, that, are, that would be politically popular. I think if, if that's why we want to do so many of these public education events, if we can, because we just think more people need to know about what's here, what's in the plan, things that people will like, and that there's potential to actually do something really positive here. If, um, if enough people can kind of get behind this and show how important it is to them. Um, so here's what it would look like in Forsyth County, because I know that Five billion over eight years is just an impossible thing to get your get your head around. At least it is for me. Um, if we invested, if we carried out the whole Leandro plan going out to year eight, Forsyth County would see a thirty three percent increase in per student funding. Um, within that, that would translate to three hundred and thirteen additional instructional support personnel, nurses, counselors, psychologists, therapists, and social workers. We would double the funding for textbooks. So it's getting back to kind of the levels it was at before all the cuts I had laid out. We'd see a 54% increase in funding for teacher assistance. I wasn't able to get that exactly into the number of positions just because of the way um, those can work where you might have some full-time, some part-time, it's hard to figure out, <laughs> but it'll be 54% increase in funding. This is a pretty, and you can see a lot of the plan does emphasize early childhood. Um, there'd be 1,235 NC, new NC pre-K slots. Again, that's just in Forsyth County. Um, a more than 360% increase in Smart Start funding. We have over 2,000 children, more children served by the infant toddler program starting at birth. Um, again, this is about having a con continuum that goes all the way from birth up into when people go into college and career. Then 25 community school coordinators, which means actually having way more community school programs run by those coordinators and schools across the district. So you can see Forsyth County stands to the thing to gain quite a bit, um, especially a lot of these are areas that have been identified as really problematic in recent years in the pandemic with some of the staffing challenges, things like that. So I think it's important that we use the federal money wisely, um, but it's also important to understand that long run, the state is the most important entity in the way our schools are fun, funded. And if we don't want the, fun, when the funds go away from the federal government that were in response to the COVID crisis, it's really the state that's going to have to pick that up um, in order to avoid even more substantial disruption to our schools. So I've probably gone on too long um, and I'll stop there and see if there's questions. And I look in the chat, there's probably people telling me to stop talking. I'm, I'm gonna...
Thank you so much, yeah. Matt. Um, okay. We're not going to shoot the messenger. We know <laughs> that you're just bringing the message and it's a message that we need to hear. Um, I didn't know if we wanted to address any questions now, or will we do all questions after we have our panelists? Well, I think the question that's in the box is something that probably Matt may have the answer to. And um, the question was, um, if the state Supreme Court rules that the plan must be funded, how does it get enforced? That's the great question. I mean, that's the that's the thing we don't really know yet. Um, the lower court judge basically tried to circumvent the legislature and just appropriate the funding. That's one way. It might be a little bit harder to do because at that point in time, there was a lot of funding that had been that was unappropriated. Revenues came in a lot higher than people expected. We had the federal money that I mentioned coming in, so that's sort of one the kind of sad thing about what happened in this last legislative session is that we had billions of dollars literally. That could have been used to fund this plan um, and they chose not to. And as the questioner points out, you know, even as they were being ordered to do so by a court, um, I do think that it's different coming from this Supreme Court, state Supreme Court. You know, I think a lot of everyone sort of sees things legally that aren't, they're not final until they've reached the last court that they could rule, they could reach, which we are fairly sure is the state Supreme Court in this. Crazy things happen, but this is such a state constitution issue that it's not really something that that the U.S. Supreme Court ought to be jumping around in. It's um, so specific to the North Carolina Constitution that the last word should go to the Supreme Court. Um, so I do think it's different to have it coming from there. They pointed out in defying the lower court ruling that it was an unelected, you know, superior court judge making this ruling. Well, I don't know if they couldn't say that about the Supreme Court. They are actually elected. For better or for worse, um, by statewide elections, and um, it's not some district court judge; it's the Supreme Court, and so it's a little different to defy that order. The other question is, everything's political. Where does it leave you? I mean, I've laid out what's in this plan. Is it so important that we not invest in our education system that you will not that you will defy this court order? that has come in based on our constitution. Is that really where you wanna draw as the legislature, draw a line in the sand and say, we refuse to fund nurses, counselors, pre-K seats, those types of things. And maybe that's what it is. Um, but I think that's a little bit of a different question than the superior court doing it. So I think it's a great question and it's a little scary. I mean, it's how does any of this work? What happens if no one listens to what the US Supreme Court says either? It's not like they have an army they call in. Um, so it's, it's not a question that it's, it shows how far we've sort of gone in uh, the degradation of our system that we have to ask that question of like, what if we just refuse to follow our own court's orders? Um, but maybe that is where we are, unfortunately. But I think that that's why this, if I thought that the court could just take care of it, I don't think we'd be so worried about doing so much public education around it, because ultimately you need a huge amount of people to care about this. Um, to get it done. And even if the court did do a great ruling, that would really only help us for the next two years that are issue at this point in the plan. This is an eight-year plan. Some of the hardest parts and most expensive parts to fund are in the later on years, like years eight, uh, like seven and eight of the plan. And so this is going to be an ongoing thing. And at some point you do need the legislature to buy into it. And we need people to be holding their elected officials accountable and telling them that this matters to them. And this is an important thing. Um, I'm hopeful that's what will happen. I hope the political pressure will build because our schools deserve this funding. Our children need it. Um, and and uh, it's, 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 a more, it's not just a constitutional obligation. There's a major moral imperative here. Um, and so I'm hopeful that it won't come to that and the people will just want to do it. And that's sort of what's happened in other states where pressure builds as it becomes more high profile and eventually the legislature sort of funds some portion of it, or at least tries to make a good faith effort to comply with the court. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matt. And as we move along, if anyone has any questions um, from Matt's presentation or for our panelists who are going to come in a minute, please put it in the chat or in the Q and A. And so we welcome our two panelists who will continue 
uh, this conversation forward. Uh, the first is Ms. Val Young, and she's with Forsyth County Association of Educators. She is the president. And we also have our superintendent of Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, Mrs. Tricia McManus. So um, we will hear from them. And the first question that I will pose to them is how would an increase in funding help with doing a better job in educating our students? And um, Ms. Uh, McManus, we'll let you start first. Hey, thank you. And Matt, thank you so much that I've, I've listened to many presentations over time and that one was extremely comprehensive, very informative and actually made sense to me as you went through the entire entire history. And so thank you so much, Matt. Um, so, oh my gosh. So, so first of all, the funding that we've recently received with, um, with, with COVID dollars, ESSER dollars is not um, sustainable. I mean, it's a, it's three years of funding. There's a lot of things we're trying to put into place now, but that would not be able to be sustainable. And knowing that it's not sustainable, we're trying to do things that, that would not um, have to then go away after three years. And so just knowing that, um, to know that the, the, the money we need for student services is critical. And that's one of the components that Matt talked about with nurses, um, um, psychologists, social workers, counselors, those roles are critical in our system and they're not adequately funded. And so we have cases where we're sharing people across schools. Um, we all know that mental health is, is a definite area of focus and we need to have folks on hand for our children um, in, in schools that have that kind of, of, of uh, uh, clinical experience and, and expertise. And so having to share folks across multiple schools like we currently do that have that ability to, to offer students um, those kind of services is not an effective model at all. So one of the things we would do is first of all, create uh, systems of support for our students through our student services staff in every single one of our schools. Every school needs to have social workers, psychologists, counselors, and a nurse. I mean, that, that is a given. Um, in this day and age and, and uh, to, to help the needs of our students. So that's that's one thing that would be critical for us. The, the early childhood experience and education for our students is another area and, and pre-K is not adequately funded. I know this is also about birth to five, um, but really our four-year-olds, I mean, having all of our students have that uh, pre-K experience, that early childhood experience prior to kindergarten is going to, is, is, is another critical uh, area. Um, that early, early learning, early readiness is would will help all of our students, especially those that have been underserved in the long run. If they have that quality experience, start building those language skills earlier. That would be another area. Our teacher pipelines. You saw the data about teacher ed programs and just numbers of teachers, and and we've been dealing with with staffing shortages. And and as you look at college of eds and and less people coming out, we have to get to a place that we can grow our own. And so teacher cadet programs are critical. Teacher pipelines, mentoring of new teachers, new teachers. When you look at data around teachers that enter the profession, if if they leave within their first couple of years, we've lost our our supply of 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 new educators coming in as though that are get as those that are getting toward the end of their career are retiring we have to be able to to continue to replenish our our um, our workforce our teaching force and so other things that we could use with these dollars have to do with um with creating strong teacher pipelines and principal pipelines um you know we can't wait till someone walks in the in the shoes of a principal to be ready there's too much work that they have to 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 walk to be able to walk into the, the the job ready to go. And so having equity centered principal pipeline that takes funding, the mentoring of teachers takes funding, all of these things take funding. And that does not even include the textbook issue we've used in the last two years to actually get new resources, textbooks into the hands of our teachers. It had been over 10 years since we had um, new textbooks, new literacy books, math books. When I first got here and was in uh, uh, was visiting classrooms, teachers across the district were just using different resources for math instruction. And when I asked what were they, you know, how did where they get the resources? Some of them the PTA had bought them, and so there was no 
access to a common uh, instructional material. Now we've used, thank goodness, we've used funding from donors like Project Impact. We've used ESSER funds to actually make sure that our students, teachers have quality materials in their hands to use to teach students and that students have quality mater instructional materials in their hands and that it's from every classroom, no matter what school you go to, you've got those materials. Well, guess what? That the, If ESSER funding's gone, how will we keep the quality textbooks going. I mean, we just, we need to be able to be, have the right resources and supports for our children. I could go on and on and on. I have a whole list based on every one of the areas that, um, that the West Ed report. I actually wrote down what, if we had these funds, what we would need to do. And I'll tell you, you know, one of the, one of the main things, and, and I'm sure Val will talk about this, is teacher compensation. And not only teacher compensation, but all the other areas that help our students be successful from bus, dress, bus drivers to our student nutrition workers, to our teacher assistants, to our secretary clericals, all, the, all of those folks are instrumental and are not paid in an adequate way. And so teacher funding is critical. And there are many studies out there because a lot of people will say, it's really not about the money, it's about other things, but I can promise you it's about both. And we cannot diminish the fact that a good salary is definitely something that, that is needed to recruit great folks into the profession. Um, there's a lot of options for people now as they enter college and go on to other professions. And so, you know, a, a great teacher salaries is gonna be something to, that's gonna make us competitive. And I'll tell you, being in North Carolina for now a year and a half, almost two, it's an amazing, beautiful state with so much to offer. If we could get our salaries, our wages, our compensation, all of that right, from the state, um, we could recruit a lot of people to our state and into, into our, our county to actually um, continue to be able to, uh, to not have shortages. So there is a lot, I could go on for an hour and I'm gonna be quiet because Val probably has a lot of other things she's gonna say, um, but I could go on and on, but these funds would really honestly allow us to provide the services our students deserve, allow us to once and for all close the achievement gaps that exist, um, you can't, you have to have the resources to be able to, to, to provide that high quality. I hate basic sound education. I, I don't like that language. I, I understand what it means, but it just doesn't sound good enough to me. Um, but that's, I mean, just to provide a basic sound education, all those things I mentioned are necessary. So thank you, Val. So when I was looking at the last um, frame that, that Matt put up, it made things clear about what we're really fighting for. So education, being a teacher is my second career. I ran a child care center for 10 years. So I know the benefit of educating a child early. Um, I did some brain study training before and you're building pathways. The more that we give them um, foreign languages, music, things like that, Val, you accidentally muted. I muted myself. I have a touch screen. That's the worst thing. But we're building all, we, we need to build pathways when they're young so that when we start talking about doing rigorous studies, those, those pathways have already been developed in them to, so that we can do rigorous study. Um, so I, I'm a person who's a proponent of early childhood education for every child, especially children in underserved areas. It's wonderful to have a child stay home with grandma. That's gonna be the most loved child that you have. But grandma may not have the wherewithal to teach the child certain things. They're gonna be loved, but they're gonna be lacking in maybe socializing, maybe um, beginning how to um, see in things from um, book text, looking at books, reading books. How do they um, um, build stories from just a picture in a book? Have an imagination, things like that. They may not get being home with grandma, but they got they have the love. But if we can give them a sound pre-K education, when they move into kindergarten, you won't be saying like the thing that I said, I moved from third grade to kindergarten. That's a big jump, I just want to tell you. But when I came to kindergarten, the thing that shocked me was that kids came in my particular classroom of 18 children, which we had small rooms of 18 children, only two received pre-K education. 
that shocked me. And then what shocked me a little further was children who didn't know the difference between a letter and a number. Well, in kindergarten, you're beginning to read. By the end of kindergarten, you can read. But I'm looking at this, I'm going, I'm, I'm thinking it's a, it's a daunting um, situation that I'm in. I have to teach them on grade level, but I have to fill in these gaps. So I always look at pre-K education like the foundation. We're putting this sound foundation for children. We're doing social and emotional. We're introducing letter sounds. We're introducing um, reading, reading text skills. We're, we're introducing mathematics. We're introducing socialization to them in kindergarten. So we're giving them this sound base to build everything on. Well, we get them in kindergarten. And if we have children who have not had this sound base, then we're having to fill in gaps for them as we give them information giving them grade level information. If we are not, we don't, if we do not have sound teaching in every grade, then they fall behind, even in kindergarten. You can have a child that is not on a kindergarten level, that's probably six months behind another, or you know, you a, a year, or even a year behind because they haven't had any instruction. But what you do is you have high quality, high quality instruction high quality educators, you have instructional leaders in there. Our TAs are not just TAs. They're instructional leaders in our classroom. You're able to do small group instruction with your teacher assistant and the teacher working in tandem to give ch get children to where they need to be. So that when we move them up to first grade, they're on that first grade level and they can soar from there. And if everyone does their job, one grade to the other, then we'll be on grade level as we are going for, forward. What happens is that we, we receive children who have gaps in their learning. That's where you need your reading specialist to pull, pull children out and fix those little gaps. We fix those little holes where you, they're having um, problems with mathematics. We have small group instruction with quality um, instructors to fix those gaps. We don't, not, we don't have 30 kids in one classroom with one teacher, and she may have 15 different learning styles. She may have 15 different um, problem um, areas that need to be tweaked. We need smaller classroom sizes. You do that, you have to have funding to do those things. You cannot do it without funding. You can't do it, you can't get subs without funding. And when you talk about money, I know that sometimes we clutch our pearls and we don't wanna say anything about money. However, if you pay people for the jobs that they are doing, I'm telling you, they will do it harder and they will do it faster because there, there's one thing there, there's love. There's love for the students there. But when you can't feed your own child, then you bring that problem and you try to sit it outside the door, but it comes in with you. And you know, when you have that heavy heart, sometimes that impacts your health. That impacts the um, the quality that you would give, you get tired. You, you're at the end of your rope. So I think that funding does a lot without good, and good um, quality um, materials. You know what you end up doing? You spend all weekend surfing the internet for things for your children. So that takes away time from your family. So funding does a lot for us. But I think the one thing we have to agree on is that if we do not pay people well, and we, we do not have high quality people in our schools, then our children have all these gaps that the, the water you're pouring in to um, help them flourish is running out. But we have the answer to fill all those gaps, smaller class sizes, great um, instructional materials, great people in the building, and I think lots of people in the building, lots of hands on deck to fill in all these holes for our children. And if we can do those things, we're gonna have a quality education for every child. Thank you, thank you so much, both of you, uh, Superintendent McManus and Ms. Val. Um, we're going to now see if there were any questions placed in the chat. And I think um, Mary Pat or Kelly are going to pose those questions. 
I see one question that says, what is the most critical step that the community can do to help with moving Leandro forward? And I think Kelly is going to give us an action piece oh, that okay. will help us with that. Yeah. Before, um, and I know when before Kelly does that, I, I wanted to say one thing that I, that, um, that I, that's exciting that is, is part of how people can let our, our, uh, our state gov government know, our state officials, elected officials know how important this to us. Our Board of Education, uh, Tuesday, um, was that yesterday? The day, the week is starting to get blurry. Um, yesterday passed uh, a uh, resolution that our Board of Education signed for, to send to, um, to the state. Um, it, it's a resolution in support of the Leandro, of Leandro and funding Leandro. And so, very excited. So if, if all boards of education did that, and if pe more people did that, and I think that supports a little bit about uh, what Matt was saying with showing support, uh, showing support for this. So thank you to our board of education for taking the initiative to do that. Hey, Kelly. And Dr. Leach, I think your question about um, has the pandemic helped or harm with moving the Leandro case forward? Or has it not? Or has it not had an impact. I, I'm just going to say my thinking. Uh, Matt probably has the answer, but I think a lot of things that we say that the um, that COVID-19, the pandemic um, has caused it, it just shined a light on it. It was already there. It's just shining a great light on everything that's happening. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and unfortunately, it makes a lot of things worse too. You know, I think the whole West Ed report was done prior to the pandemic. So it doesn't really even factor in the learning loss, the turnover, all of the issues that we've seen. So even before the pandemic, uh, what was it? some people say we had a pandemic of underfunding, you know, that we, it, it's so, but it's going to be worse than it is even represented in any of the things that I showed. Same thing with students' outcomes are actually going to be more dire in their appearance. I don't know that it slowed down the case. But I hope it's increased the urgency on the part of certainly the judges involved um, and um, you'd hope the legislators. I think I hope that they're understanding what's happening in their communities. It's not a partisan issue that's only happening in counties that look like this or that. These are problems that were across the board. So we've all had this kind of um, shared experience of living through this thing that showed a lot about what educators have to deal with on a day to day basis. How thankful we should be for what they do for our children, how much we miss them when we had our children at home. <laughs> um, and so I think it's opened up opportunities in some ways, and it's maybe opened up some wounds too and, and made them worse than they even were before. But uh, my hope is that that urgency, you know, you can see a lot of it was around positions. A lot of those are mental health positions. I think that's an area where we can move people. People are getting there's a lot of mental health issues that have come from the pandemic than they were there before it, but it's exacerbated those. So I think there's some, you know, it's laid some of those things bare and there's some opportunity. Can't give up on people just because they haven't agreed with us in the past. Yeah, we have to continue to hold, um, we have to continue to ask our legislators or whatever you want, language you want to use, demand, I don't know, that they do, that they meet the constitutional standards been laid out and that they invest in our school, they invest in our children. And I think it's in a weird way giving us an opportunity if we can figure out a way to take it. I think Kelly will have a better way of uh, explaining that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for the answers to those questions. Were there any more questions in the chat that needed to be addressed? No? So before um, Kelly comes, um, Superintendent McManus, did you want to share your resolution? I can, um, sure. Let me do that really quickly. Share my screen. It says draft, but it actually is was approved uh, the other night. So the final one um, will not say draft on it, or this is the final one, but it won't say draft when we when we go to sign it. So if you look on this, um, if you can see the slide, can everybody, Val, do you give me a thumbs up? Uh, everybody, okay, somebody, thank you. Um, so basically, you can see, I'll just briefly read it if that's okay, and everyone can follow along, but whereas approximately 25 years ago, 
North Carolina Supreme Court held that the North Carolina Constitution guaranteed every child an opportunity for access to a sound basic education, whereas the opportunity for access to a sound basic education represents the floor of educational opportunities that must be afforded to all students. Whereas a constitutional obligation to provide access to a sound basic education includes provisions for ensuring competent, well-trained teachers in every classroom, principals who are equipped with resources to recruit and retain competent, well-trained teachers and adequate resources to support effective instruction for all students. And now that I'm doing this, I'm thinking that you all can just read it real quick because I'm not sure you want to just listen to me reading it this entire time. So I'll just be quiet for a minute, read it through, and then I'll, I'll, I'll read the last part. So if you've gotten to the final one, so then the final part of it says, now therefore be it resolved that the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School Board of Education request that the North Carolina General Assembly prioritize the full implementation of the Leandro plan, including the enactment of necessary policy and funding reforms to ensure that all North Carolina students have access to a sound basic, basic education by the 2028 school year. And so it was adopted this Tuesday night. So thank you for letting me share that. I thought it was a good idea to read it and then I thought, no, it's too long. So anyway, but thank you for, for uh, looking at that, uh, looking at this and supporting, supporting this. Thank you. Well, we do thank you because, because it's long, it means that probably nothing has been left out. And we appreciate everything that you are doing to support our children, our babies. And so now we will move to um, Ms. Kelly Eastman with Action for Equity, and she is going to share action items. Yes, thank you, um, Reverend Leach. This has been um, very insightful. So I just thank the panelists, um, Ms. Trisha McManus and Ms. Val Young. Thank you, Matt Ellenwood, my... Um, uh, co-conspirator um, and Mary Pat for providing the technology, um, the, the um, yeah, helping us navigate all our technology. And to you, um, Elder Timbila Covington for um, just joining um, with, um, just joining the collective of me, you, Val. Um, we, we got together um, a few months ago or a few, yeah, I guess it's probably we started a conversation a few months ago about what, what what's needed in order to um, gain more momentum around Leandro. And so at that point, we knew that it um, it would be um, it would be ideal for us to be able to come together and to unite and to go out and to raise awareness. And so this here tonight was just that first step. If we're ever going to slow down and eliminate the opportunity gaps and remove the barriers that prevent our community from achieving the best of our collective dreams, we will need to reimagine what it means to be an advocate. And again, that's exactly why Forsyth County Association of Educators, the Minister's Conference of Winston-Salem and Vicinity and Action for Equity are coordinating Forsyth Leandro it is an effort to raise awareness of the Leandro case and the opportunity that it will provide in order to increase the wages of our educators who are essential to the fabric of our community, to ensure our students have access to mental health services that so many of them desperately need, especially in light of COVID, to strengthen the infrastructure of our schools, and quite simply to resource, restore and revive the dry and the neglected areas that the lack of funding has produced throughout Winston-Salem Forsyth County school system. So again, tonight we invite you to become an advocate and join Forsyth Leandro as we fight to ensure every child in Forsyth County, regardless of how much money their family makes, regardless of the color of their skin, what side of town that they live on, that every single child has what he or she needs in order to grow up and to make a positive contribution to our community. Last week, I was among um, a few peers and I asked a question, 
Who's responsible for the children of Forsyth County, the children of our village? The truth is we all are. So when you join Forsyth Landro, you're going to join a community that is taking a stand to say that our children matter, all our children matter, and that we as a community understand that in order to ensure that every child has a sound and basic education, again, just a sound and basic education, we are going to need to fully fund our schools. So I wanted to give you three action items. The first one, I want you to visit every child in C dot org to learn about um, to learn more about Leandro. There are a variety of resources there, toolkits, so you can just learn more about this case and the work that is taking place um, throughout our state. The second thing I want you to do is again to get connected by joining um, Forsyth Leandro by visiting ForsythLeandro.com or org to learn what we are going to do here in our local community in order to continue and to build upon this fight. And then the third thing, after you, after you visit those two sites, then I want you to make a commitment to continue to show up, to talk to your neighbors, to talk to your elected officials and let them know that we need to fully fund our schools and we need to do it now. Thank you. Well, here we are, everyone. We have come to the close of our webinar session, and we want to thank all of our presenters, Matthew Ellenwood, Superintendent Tricia McManus, uh, Ms. Val Young, Forsyth County Association of Educators President, uh, we want to thank you for all of the insight, information, and education you have shared on this evening. We also want to thank our partnering organizations, uh, Action for Equity with Kelly Easton, the North Carolina Justice Center, the Forsyth County Association of Educators, and the Minister's Conference of Winston-Salem and Vicinity, all who have come together to plan this event. And of course, we thank all of you for having taken time away from your time to learn more about the Leandro case. Although the Leandro case is complex, as North Carolina citizens, we must advocate, as Ms. Kelly Eggston said, for equitable resource education, more resources for children in schools, direct resources and opportunities for under-resourced community students, which are the black and brown students, increased services and increased teacher pay. We need to ask our state legislators to support Leandro's plan to release public educational school, flex, school funding. We hope that you have enjoyed this event and that you are certainly sparked with interest to learn more about policies that affect the effectiveness and the quality of our learning school systems for all students in Forsyth County and the state of North Carolina. We invite you to join us in this work and to follow us to hear more for upcoming educational webinars. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.